All right. Thank you for joining us back here, uh, really for a special one. This is going to be, you've already seen it. It's a it's a shorty here, uh, but it's going to lead into, we're doing, um, call it a two-parter, if you will. We've got today's guest that we're going to talk a lot about uh, football and track coaching and how that coexists. And then next week, we're going to have another football coach, track coach, and we're going to talk about more about that. We're going to, we're trying to bust some myths here that you absolutely can coach both. You can absolutely prioritize both as well, by the way. And so we're going to learn a lot from these two coaches here the next two weeks. So let's get into it. Help me welcome the head track coach for Naperville North, the defensive coordinator for Naperville North uh, football, the wise, the wonderful Mr. Chris Arthurs. Chris, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Absolutely, man. This is exciting. I love, uh, first of all, I love reality. And what I mean by that is there are a lot of coaches track coaches on the high school level that are football coaches. Um, I'm willing to bet that there's a lot of football coaches on the high school level that would like to coach track, uh, but maybe don't think they have time because football is a 24 seven uh, sport. However, track and field can, and maybe should be a 24 seven sport as well to coach. So uh, I'm excited to learn more about you and your experiences and how we might be able to help others that are out there uh, with these same thoughts and feelings. So, Chris, let's start with, though, you know, we are coach based, you know, we uplift and honor coaches from around the world. That's one of the reasons we have you here today with us as well for the great work that you do with our young people out there. Let's start with the shoulders that you stand on from your past. What coaches have um, poured into you positively and what has your coaches that you've had uh, done for you? What are they with the impact that they've made on you specifically? For sure. Um, so it all it starts with my father. Um, you know, he coached me. He coached. Uh, I'm the oldest of four boys, and he actually coached all four of us. And uh, he actually currently coaches on our defensive staff now with us. He's uh, 66 years old, and he's still coaching on the side with awesome. us. And uh, so, you know, he kind of laid the groundwork and the roots for that relationship of you know positive coach father relationship. And um, after that, you know, I was very fortunate to attend a successful high school at We Warmel South. And that's where I began my career working as well. Coach Ron Mulich, our head football coach, and Coach Ken Hoberg, our head track and field coach, are two guys that, you know, I had a great relationship with throughout my high school days as a student athlete and then got to be working the profession with them when I first started. And I learned so much from them and saw such a different side of what it's like being, you know, a student athlete under them and then working professionally with them. And they were huge mentors in my beginnings and learning them, you know, I've got quotes, several quotes from both of those coaches about different things that have carried over with me uh, 13, 14 years now into the profession. Like, you know, relationships are everything. It was so simple and so little, but, you know, when you first start the profession, you're like, oh, it's all the X's and O's and logistics and training. And, you know, you learn as you get through it that that's really everything. And those are just uh, two guys that I started my career with as an athlete and then continue with it professionally. And then uh, when I came over to Naperville North, uh, Sean Drendel, our head football coach, and Coach Dan Iverson, our head girls track coach, are two guys that have been excellent partners with me, um, grown relationshiply, and I've still learned a lot from them. And also Rob Harvey, the girls coach at Wheaton Wormel South. You know, those are six guys that between the two places I've worked at have taught me so much. You know, I could, you know, like I mentioned, Rob Harvey, he's one of the best meat hosts in the entire country as far as I'm concerned. And that's something that I was able to carry over to my next school, the, the aspect of hosting a meet that's so important for track and field that I learned from him and brought over to our facility that we've used. Um, Dan Iverson's one of the best girls track and field coaches across the country. And the things he does with his program, I've learned, watched, and had great conversations with Don Drendel, our head football coach. Um, you know, he's an alumni of the school. He's a hometown grown athlete, student athlete coach learn, you know, what having super duper un, unbelievable pride in this program and watching that unfold and how he pours it into his student athletes. So every, per, every professional, those are just six off the top of my head, but been super fortunate to work with those individuals and giving them a shout out for everything they did for me as an athlete, as a coach, and then professionally, it's been, I've been very, very, very lucky. We tend to think of the word outliers in a positive manner, and that's that's good. I, we should continue that. You know, the the uh, the Michael Jordan, um, the uh, Simone Biles. These are outliers that have you know just transformed their sport uh, in our professions. Uh, almost said specifically high school, but no, uh, in our profession of track and field, there are some also negative outliers, meaning coaches who um, you know just don't do the right things when it comes to how they treat their athletes. 
and those are are bad, <laughs> right? That's a, a obvious statement. How did those coaches that you had? They obviously exemplified positivity, uh, encouragement. When you think about, you know, around your junior year, you decided like, oh yeah, this is what I want to be. I want to be one of them. When you think about why you wanted to emulate them, what were some of the examples that you were, that you kind of glommed onto was like, yeah, I want to like, I, they, they make me feel good. I I, I want to do this. Absolutely. So, um, you know, like you mentioned, I was, I was 17 years old, a junior in high school, sitting in my, my science class and I had like my meeting with my future or with my counselor that day I was like you know what I think it'd be awesome to be a teacher and a coach and I just thought about you know the experiences that I had in football and track and field with coach Muhich and coach Helberg and how they pushed me to be the best I possibly could and then I started to look around like man they do that with everybody you know the kids are my teammates my friends like they pushed us and helped us to be the best we possibly could and um, I think that that's such a awesome aspect of working with young adults and young student athletes at the high school level of, you know, being the best person, individual you can, helping you really search for that and what it takes to get to that point. And those are two guys that as growing up as a student athlete, I had the ability to work on or be coached by. And that whole aspect of providing amazing experiences within the sport, um, you know, everything we were able to experience was so top notch and just top of the line, both how we operated as programs and the success we had. And then, you know, them as individuals helping us see our best and work towards it and become the best people we probably could, you know, it, it laid the groundwork for, you know, the adult, the father that I become, and then, you know, the different people that have impacted me, but it really laid the groundwork for how I wanted to live my life. And uh, they taught me some great things. That's awesome. Well, let's get into some of those things they taught you that you now exemplify. You know, we I say that not <clears throat> flippantly when I say you stand on the shoulders of others because now you are positively impacting young people in the 14 to 18 year old range. And there's someone you may already have someone at this you know young part of your career here that has gone on to coach because of how you made them feel and how you coach them. Let's talk about this football slash track dichotomy, if you will. Um, you know, football in America is typically seen as more important, air quotes there, uh, because of, you know, there's a professional league, NFL, um, you know, the millions that people are getting paid for that. There's college that is on TV every Friday, Saturday, um, high schools, you know, the, the state championship series is a big deal. People go to the games, things like that. And in track, not so much, but it doesn't mean it's less important because you're still affecting young people. My first question, and it might not be a fair question, so you you push back. Are you a football coach who coaches track, or are you a track coach who coaches football? Um, I, I believe it or not, you're not the first person that's asked that question. I've also gotten like, "What do you like about this, and what do you like about that?" I think that they both serve each other so well. And as we learn more about different things, like I love the schematic and game planning and opponent preparation aspect of football and then applying that to track you know when you look at setting lineups and putting kids in the best position for their success and your team success it's kind of like the same thing and then when you look at track and the performance output of it marrying that to football and having your student athletes who are performing at their highest level you know all the way down the stretch it's really twofold and we've been doing a great job of that um, working with our head strength coach at Naval North Kevin Menages of mirroring that aspect of performance related to team sport output. Um, so when you ask the question of if I'm one or the other, I think I'm, I'm just a coach. I coach both. I love both. Obviously as the head head coach of track and field, there's more um, responsibilities with being a head, a head coach compared to an assistant. Um, but if you were to ask me, you know, which one do I like better? Which one, you know, is different than the other. I'd say I'm, I'm just a coach who loves both sports equally. And, uh, enjoy coaching the heck out of both of them. Great answer. Cause like I said, I'm not, I'm not sure it was a fair question to be real frank to ask it. You, you know, if you, if, if you answered, I'm a football coach who coaches track, we would just cut the interview short. So you knew you couldn't go <laughs> that route. So appreciate that uh, openness and authenticity there, Chris, you know, typically we think of track as a sport that would help football players. So that help to become a better football player, uh, I'm going to ask you kind of a two-parter. First of all, how do you use track? to improve your football players, but also I'm going to ask the opposite way there. Does football playing football help your track athletes in some way as well? Both those questions for you. 
hundred percent. Um, you know, when you look at how track benefits football, we'll start with that aspect of it. So, um, you know, as a college athlete, you're able to experience what a year a year round training calendar looks like, right? You know, you you play your football season in the fall, you have your winter, and then you go into your winter training, and then you go into spring ball. Well, my my whole thought was when I started getting into this, I'm like, it's kind of the same where you know our track athletes, you know, we finish up our football season. We kind of reload, retool, get ready for winter off season. And then we go and do, um, I'm sorry, with our track athletes, we start our track season with winter season. And then we finish with outdoor. And it's kind of married the same where, you know, you train your guys. To, realistically in Illinois, you know, our indoor season is getting ready for outdoor. Outdoor is the big time. You know, that's where state championships are won. State all state medals are awarded, of course. And, um, you know, we kind of marry that concept of win- winter is all about, getting strong, getting fat, getting explosive. And then the spring is really that super competitive time where it's like, let's go, you know, it's time to focus in on the sport and getting, you know, the best we possibly can with different events. And so marrying that concept of a year round training calendar with two sports, I think has really helped our athletes become super competitive, to be honest. And it's something, you know, we talk about with our athletes, we compete year round, you know, in a football season, if at best, you know, you're looking at, 14-0 14 and 0 season best state championship you know that's 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 14 games well if you add in another 20 weeks of track that's competing 20 20 weeks added on to that so now you're having your athletes compete almost double that so there's that competitive aspect of you know lining up against somebody in the season and then racing them in the spring and competing against them so it's huge competitive bonus when you're competing year round and uh so when you marry that training aspect with the competitive aspect, I really think it's it's a great way to go with your student athletes. That's a great reminder. We think of the long football season, which it is, uh, but at the end of the day, we're only getting at best maybe 14 opportunities to compete. I know we compete during practice for our position and things like that, but it's still practice. It's another thing to line up against another person and actually block or tackle, et cetera. There's competition there. Track and field allows that person to um, experience and leverage competing more times as well. A little bit different, obviously. Let's not tackle anybody on the track, but we're competing, whether we're throwing against them, jumping against them, sprinting or running against them. That's that's really great. You, you know, we've interviewed lots of high school coaches that uh, only co- <clears throat> excuse me only coach track and field or maybe co- uh, coach cross country as well. And one of the things that I love about track and field is that it's easy to be a 365 day consuming, all consuming. I'm not sure that that's always necessarily healthy to be real frank with you. I wish our coaches both at the high school and college level had some off time, if you will. Um, but we can, uh, if we're not training, we're, we're learning, <laughs> we're taking seminars, we're going to clinics you're doing this for both. I mean, I have to imagine on the football side, there's just as many opportunities for clinics and um, um, talking to peers. Uh, You talked about the schematics. How do you learn a different defense that you might be able to incorporate in yours? How do you, how do you balance the two or or do you not? Is is one get 70% of your time, the other one gets 30. How do you, how do you deal with that? I I love that percentage reference because, you know, obviously it's not, foolproof what your percentage is but that's what all kind of rolls right like when you're in season you know you're about 90 percent the sport that's in season and you're you still have concepts and things you're working on and learning specifically in the uh during in season phase of the other sport and then when you're in your off season you know for football it's the winter and then for track it's really the summer where you're learning and prepping and getting ready for the next the next season upcoming but also reflecting on the previous one um it's a continuous go time, which I love as a coach, you know, like there, we have times, you know, we have state rules where we have off time where we're not, we're not working with student athletes period. Um, You know, we have times in our schedule where we're not. And so those are those great times to release, spend time focusing on just, you know, your family, those th- things like that. Um, But yeah, just having that a great organization of what needs to be done is super important, especially as, you know, the head track coach, you know, like I, I have one rule in the summer. I never finish the summer without having my calendar started for the upcoming track season. And, you know, even though it's in the, in the winter and the spring, that's just something that kind of follows that percentages. It's the one thing, you know, always done going into the specific practice, you know, the practice schedule married with the school calendar. 
all that stuff. Uh, so that's one thing I do to help stay organized for the upcoming and then working on the other at the same time. Yeah, I can't imagine. Yeah, I know how organized uh, a coach who only does track and field. I can't imagine having to, again, do more than one sport that are radically different. Like you said, you know, the X's and O's are are important in football. Uh, there are some X's and O's in track, but you're not, you know, working on defensive sch- schemes. You're not breaking down film like you are in football. Uh, I, c- I can't imagine the amount of organization. Oh, by the way, your full-time job is being a teacher. <laughs> so, uh, you know, yeah. my, my wife is a long-term sub, so I know what goes into, uh, you know, on the sub side. So I know on the teacher side, it's even more, holy cow. You mentioned a very important factor in there. Uh, the number one factor, family. How do you, how do you prioritize? You know, you, you're, you're a spouse, you're a father, uh, you play many, many roles, of course, coach, teacher, um, maybe you're a brother, maybe a best friend, someone, there's a lot of roles you have there. How do you prioritize one of the uh, more important ones, uh, family? Absolutely. Um, like you mentioned, I'm the father to two boys, a three and a one-year-old. Oh. And, uh, you know, when we walk in the door, their time, you know, their time, I'm there for that time, for the time they're awake. Um, I try to make that non-negotiable. Um, and then, you know, my wife, my wife stays at home with them. So that's, it pairs up nice where it's a relief for her, where, you know, dad can take over and spend his time with his boys and same thing with the weekend. Um, you know, the holiday season, the summer season, you know, those times where you have it planned or that's their time I'm theirs and that's how I want to be. And that's how they want me to be. So giving them those opportunities is super, super critical, right? Like it's not walking in the door upset about what happened at practice or the previous game. It's not you know, letting the stress of the job carry over to the home. It's having a set priority of, you know, their, their, when I'm with them, their time, I'm there for their, for them. Dive into into that a little bit deeper, Chris, you know, what you just said there is easier said than done. You know, again, you know, I'm interviewing 99% of coaches who are only coaching track and field. And I know there's a lot of frustrations, whether it's at practice or at a meet, a drop baton, a called foul that are frustrating. You you lose the conference championship by a point. Um, you didn't get that one kid that you just knew was going to make it to state. They didn't qualify. There's frustrations and, and, and going to the home front. How do you put those frustrations to the back you you got two sports to be frustrated. It's very easy to be frustrated in football. <laughs> you know, there is, first of all, there's a final score at every single game. Uh, but even no matter that there could, you know, you're the defensive coordinator, you could win uh, 60 to 59 and, you know, yeah, the team won, but you know, you're frustrated because we gave up 59 points, you know, things like that. So dive in that just a little deeper here. How do you actually cope with that? So you're coming home on a Friday night, that, that 60 to 59 kind of example, you're frustrated, you know, the, the opponent next week is even tougher. So man, if you gave up 59 on this one, you're going to give up 159. And there is little Arthur's coming up to you. Uh, you're their hero, no matter what, but you are just frustrated. Maybe you got into an argument with a coach or what, whatever, you, you know, you've been through these, um, your mind's on the track is starting in four weeks. How, how do you not, not just the saying, I, I, you know, I put that to the back of my, mind. how do you actually, I don't want to put words in your mouth and say, close that part off so that you can focus here. But how do you actually do that? That's a very common thing for our coaches out there. So uh, one of the rules I have for myself is when I walk in the door, I set the backpack aside, you know, my backpack, I carry my laptop, I carry practice plans, everything for the school day. And that gets put aside, like in a different room, I have it in because I know if I have access to that, I'm going to, you know, I want to watch film. You know, I want to work on practice plans, lineups, all those different things. But the backpack gets put in a different room when the kids are awake and I'm with my wife. And uh, that's just a set rule that I've had for myself since, you know, I've been become a father, um, you know, since I've been married. When, you know, when I get home after a day and they've missed me and uh, they're excited for dad to walk in the door, the backpack gets put away until they're in bed. Um, with that said, you know, there's some late, later nights that things get done, obviously, once the uh, wife and kids are in bed and that's that's a part of it too. Like you have to understand that there's going to be times where you're working late at night and thankfully I love what I do. So the prospect the you know, of working late nights has never been a problem for me. I love, I'm very thankful and I love what I do. And, uh, but it does get done later at night, not when they're awake, not when my time is theirs and their time, you know, and their time is mine. Um, seeing, you know, your family's face and you walk in really helps, helps me close the door, some, not close the door, but, think about, you know, what, what needs to get done at that point in time. 
I think that's a that's really good advice, Chris. You know, what you mentioned there is symbolism. Like, hey, when the backpack, when I come in, if I have that backpack on me, I'm I'm in football or track coaching mode. I can break down film. I can be working on my lesson plans. I can be working on the next week's opponent, but I'm going to take that backpack off, put it in another room. And, and I think you're right when you say close the door. Close the door. Again, it's, this is symbolism part. That, that backpack being in another room or being right next to your foot, actually, did, you still make the same decisions. But it's that symbolism of it's in another room. And guess who is in the room? My little ones and my wife. Uh, so this is what is in front of me and is important. I, I like that. I think that's really good advice for, for coaches, that symbolism. It is important. There's a reason why you know people do some crazy things over symbolism. So I like this positive symbolism of, yep, this goes in another room. Uh, that that part is shut off for now. It, and it's a door, by the way, that means it can open up later, you can get that work done later. But this door is open over here with my with my kids. I, I love that. that's really practical. Like someone can someone's <laughs> listening to this right now, and they can actually go start implementing that right now today. So I love that. That's great advice. Appreciate that. You know, in in the same vein of, you know, one of our goals here is to provide massive amounts of values to those who do listen to us. We're so humbled for the many, many listeners that we do have. So that's great value. Chris, one of your passions is uh, your own uplifting and honoring coaches and how do you uh, bring young people into this profession as, as you were brought in by great examples. What would you, if you you kind of have, not if, not if you do, you have the mic right now for many, many young people. We have, we have college kids that listen to this, that want to be coaches. Uh, we have first year uh, coaches. We have 60 year coaches. Uh, what advice might you give for someone? I'm, I'm going to keep you on the high school side and because I want to, I, I think there is a group of people, whether you're a track coach or a football coach, and you would like to coach the other sport, but you just don't think you can. You just don't think that you can give 100% for each of those kids. But there is a lot of modeling out there. And Chris, you're one of those models that it can be successful. What advice would you give for that type of coach? Um, you know, it, once you get into the business, find somebody who you can mentor and learn from and take notes. Like any way you can take notes and listen, being a great listener. Um, I don't know. I wouldn't consider myself early in the profession anymore, but being a great listener is a huge skill for a coach. Listening to your student athletes, listening to your coworkers, listening to, you know, your administration, your bosses. So understanding that being a listener is just as important, if not more important at times in this profession is huge. Um, can't understate that enough to younger coaches that are just starting the position um, of coaching and teaching and, uh, you know, enjoying the aspect of, you know, your student athletes, they look up to you. They, they want to follow you. So, you know, a practice plan might not be great. A, you know, a scheme might not be great. Something might not go well schematically in your training and your practices and your game but those are kids that are going to love and listen to you. And so really having that background of understanding that they're looking and listening to you um, a lot is going to be huge in your relationships with your kids and being a positive role model for them. And, you know, you can push kids, right? Like we're always trying to get the best out of our young kids. And that's part of the best thing of the profession with high schoolers is teaching them to be the best they can. You know, we're not dealing with 30 division one athletes, 40 division one athletes, hundred division. You're dealing with young kids who are there because they love the sport and being understanding that and they love there and they if you love them they will love you back and they see who and they know who loves them so love your kids to death coach them hard um be present in their lives outside of practice time when you can you know through the hallway say hi to people say hi to kids say hi to staff members um enjoy the experience of not just from that two-hour practice window of being a coach but that 24 hours that every the seven days a week of being a coach, the relationship piece with people. What a great piece of advice. If you love them, you'll love them. But if you lead with love, you're more than likely to get love back. If you lead with contempt or suspicion uh, or whatnot, you're more likely to get that back. So what a great, uh, you know, I, I, I think of that obviously in the coaching realm, but I think of that in the dad realm and in the spouse realm. It's like, man, lead with love. And, and they're more than likely going to love you back. You, you got a higher likelihood. Chris, thank you so much. You know, it's uh, very vital what our high school teachers and coaches do out there. And there is a unique subset of coaches who coach two very powerful sports, football, and track and field. And uh, really, it's proud of the way that you do lead these young men and women. Um, you know, it's kind of, I sit in a very unique seat of interviewing coaches from around the world. And, you know, we're 
way past 200, we're 250 ish or whatnot at this point. Um, I'm really excited, like in 10 years to interview someone. And I say, Hey, so how did you get into coaching? You're like, you know what, actually way back in two uh, hundreds, you had my coach, Chris Arthurs. Uh, and I'll be able to tell that that person, well, Hey, let me tell you what Chris actually, you know, you, you got Chris because of his dad and this coach that worked with him at Wheatonville, like it's an amalgamation of everybody. And so what you're doing today with this uh, amazing experiences that you've had great advice that you have I mean, really practical stuff today, Chris, uh, you're helping other coaches to be able to do their profession or their future profession, uh, even better, which means you're affecting other people, 14, 18 years old in a positive manner. So Chris, so excited, uh, that you join us today. I'm really grateful. Join us next week. Uh, we've got another football coach and I, I guess what I asked him, is he a football coach? You know, I just, it's a terrible question, but I love asking it. Uh, we'll see how he knocks it out of the park. You're going to quite enjoy that, but let's continue working with our young people, no matter what sport they're doing. Let's encourage our athletes to do more than one sport. Absolutely. We want them doing track and field, but football is a great sport cross country, tennis, golf, basketball. Those are all great sports, especially in the high school side. Um, Cause man, 99% of these guys and gals aren't going on to the college side, definitely aren't going uh, onto the pro side, but they are going on to be moms and dads and business owners and uh, clergy and coaches, et cetera. And so that's the real impact that you have on society. And it's absolutely immeasurable. So thanks for being here this week. Join us next week. We'll do it all over again as we uplift and honor coaches from around the world. Thanks everybody.